Gates. I have honor to announce our last host, Professor Charles Colum. Welcome. For joining us, my name is Ante Bresic Plemenit Mikulic. I'm today's host in this small interview and lecture we have with Mr. Charles A. Colum. Uh, the, the name Charles A. Colum is an American European uh, Catholic author, historian, theologian, and in the wider sense, known for his monarchical tendencies and subjects regarding history and current events in the Catholic Church. He is currently uh, pursuing postgraduate studies in Austria. His uh, last two books were about the Holy Grail and Blessed Kaiser Karl, especially the last name is quite famous in the circles regarding uh, Blessed Karls, and he has quite an interesting uh, lecture on it, and we'll talk about it, of course, in our small talk. So, uh, it's 1st April now, uh, or for us, time travelers, travelers since we <laughs> are recording this a couple of days uh, earlier. So, where are you now on the 1st April? Well, I'm actually bilocating, uh, so I guess I've achieved sainthood already. Since I'm in the on the I'm on ah, on the first of April, I am on the island of Madeira uh, for the centennial of Kaiser Karl at his shrine. Uh, but since we're pre-recording, I'm also here in beautiful Trumau, Austria. So this is the connection of Zagreb, Trumau, and Madeira at the same time. That's right, all all at once so through the miracle of, elect of electronics uh computers and uh, uh god knows what uh, there is also something interesting you will be presenting the croatian royal council there at uh, the feast and the celebrations that are concerning the centennial of the death of blessed uh carl charles or in croatian as you call him carl uh, so let's begin with the first topic and that's the life of blessed carl or charles uh, as a Catholic. Uh, what were his personal beliefs and devotions in regarding his Catholic faith? Why is he important for the Catholic Church and why is he important for us as a, a saint in this time, a blessed, but in the future also a canonized saint? Well, a number of reasons, a number of things, a number of reasons. Firstly, as far as his own devotion went, uh, he was very much a product of a particular kind of devotion peculiar to the House of Habsburg that was called traditionally the Pietas Austriaca, the Austrian piety. And it involves a great deal of uh, devotion to the, to the passion of our Lord, to the Sacred Heart, to uh, the Eucharist, the Rosary, very Marian, very much about Our Lady, uh, very, very much uh, circulating around the feast days of the church particularly Holy Week, Corpus Christi, and uh, in, the, in the days of the empire, both the, uh, the washing of feet by the emperor on Monday, Thursday, the feet of poor people, and his marching in the procession on Corpus Christi. These are two of the high points of the imperial year. Uh, <clears throat> and so it was for Karl. But beyond that, he was, as I say, extremely devoted to the Sacred Heart, uh, the great uh, Basilica of the Sacred Heart in Hall in the Tyrol, uh, which was really founded by his uh, uncle, the murdered Franz Ferdinand. He ended up opening because Franz Ferdinand, of course, was killed before he could do so. Uh, he was also very much a, um, a patron of Maria Zell, the uh, Magna Mata Austriae. And in fact, he and his wife, after they got married, went there. He said to his wife after they got married, Zita, <clears throat> now we must begin to help each other get to heaven. So he took his marriage vows as a sacrament very, very seriously, as he did his coronation vows as King of Hungary and Croatia. This is very, very important to understand the man because he considered his uh, role as monarch to be as much a holy vocation as his role as a married man. Now, where is he in terms of, of uh, a patron that we can look to today? Who can look to him? Well, several kinds of folk. 
are the most obvious of leaders because he represented a kind of leadership that's completely alien to us moderns today, as the events of the past few months have reiterated in case we needed to be reminded again, just in case we hadn't caught on. And that is sacrificial leadership that sees its role as servant of those whom it leads and whom, if necessary, will die for its subjects. That is the kind of leadership that every leader should attempt, should strive for, even if you're, it's just a question of running a company or being a landlord. Uh, but Kaiser Karl really, really exemplified it. So if you're in any kind of a position of authority, he's a great one to look to. Another is soldier, because he's a very, very brave soldier personally. Uh, when he was commander on the Italian front, he actually leapt into a, into a, a flash flood to rescue a uh, uh, lame soldier. Uh, personally, at the uh, at the danger of his life, he was not averse to uh, fighting by any means. He certainly tried to pursue the mission, but like any real soldier, he loved peace. He insisted the soldiers, that uh, prisoners be treated humanely. And he was against things like gas warfare, unconditional uh, uh, submarine warfare, all of the uh, things that have made modern war so horrific, he opposed. We can, Besides, also, hmm? we can also say that he's interesting from one point of view, which is not quite common in the imperial and royal family, and that his education uh, and upbringing, of course, it was royal, but he had he was the first Habsburg to have a full on uh, civil or how to say wider education yes. than other Habsburgs. We can follow him as a young boy uh, when he used to go to summer vacations and uh, Easter vacations on, on the Adriatic coast, especially Opatia, Abasia, like, uh, like it was known at that time. And uh, there are uh, recordings, of course, and in his personal diaries, he had a lot of Croatian boy, uh, boys as friends. He also no. took Croatian from that time, and they all uh, uh, had influenced him in some kind of uh, bravery, because uh, as kids in our uh, both Eastern and Dalmatian coast, do, they tend to do uh, stupid things. They tend to do small uh, gestures, that show uh, uh, heroics. And he played with those uh, uh, children of Croatian fishermen, and that, of course, influenced him. Now, can, uh, can you tell me uh, how did his also influence regarding primary, secondary school affect him as a leader? Uh, did his absence from a traditional court education uh, influenced him as a good monarch? Or was it something that uh, was negative in his upbringing? Well, I don't think it was negative, And there were elements of it that he did get. Uh, like every Habsburg, you know, was expected to pursue some trade, like bookbinding or clock making or something like that. It was expected of each and every one of them. And uh, there was certainly a big emphasis on the military in his education which was typical. But you're quite right in that he had a, a scientific education, for instance, in high school at the uh, uh, um, Schotten uh, Kloster in Vienna, uh, which was very, very unlike most archdukes. And then he went to the University of Prague. Uh, so he had an, an interesting combination, you might say, of the traditional and the modern. But remember when he was quite young, it was not expected that he would ever inherit the throne. That was, he was <laughs> far out of line. When he was born, uh, Franz Joseph had a son, <clears throat> the Crown Prince Rudolf, um, and then senior to his own, to uh, Karl's own father was Franz Ferdinand, who would have children in case anything happened to Rudolf. So his becoming emperor was highly unlikely which is why his education was not as carefully supervised in the beginning, because it didn't seem as he, that he would need to be. 
Um, but there are two other points I want to make, though, in terms of, of uh, types of people that uh, could look to him as a patron. Uh, parents, because, you know, he had eight children, uh, the eighth born after he died. And he was very, very keen on their education. He taught them catechism himself. Uh, he was very affectionate with them. And he considered them his uh, really, alongside his marriage, his greatest duty. Also a great patron for husbands. Because, as I say, his marriage was um, a huge part of who he was. And, and this is something that only occurred to me toward the end of writing the book. He's also a great patron for children of difficult or broken homes because his parents were very ill-suited for each other and they, they, <laughs> they didn't get along very well. But he managed not only to get along with both of them, but to get the best out of each of them. Um, and that would serve him in good stead because after uh, his uncle, Franz Ferdinand married morganatically so his own children could not inherit the throne. That was when he became the heir to Franz Ferdinand. I don't know if uh, you can, Charles, see uh, the photograph uh, presented, but our viewers uh, will be able to have to. Edeking, this is uh, one of my uh, older uh, paintings done uh, on a photographic source, which represents Blessed Charles and Franz Josef in 18. 94 and you can oh. see almost the tension like feeling that uh, it, of unease be, uh, between both of them and that could surely be seen that uh, uh, he himself was not uh, intended for the throne he was no. just another uh, son of another austrian archduke right there's uh, you know the old the old joke in england is sort of ap apropos here the heir and the spare <laughs> and he was he was definitely the spare at the beginning. But interestingly enough, and this is one of the several weird elements in his story, when he was five and his parents were still on good terms, his father was assigned in the army to Schoprum, uh, Urdenborg, which is now in Hungary, surrounded by Burgenland. And he had a, a priest who was his tutor, taught him catechism and so forth. Uh, and the priest, in turn, had a friend who was a nun, Mother Vincentia, Vincentia, who was an Ursuline, and she ran the local Ursuline school. But she was also a stigmatic and was believed to have the gift of prophecy. Well, when the priest told her about his little five-year-old uh, Archduke charge, she said, that boy will one day be Emperor of Austria. But although he'll be the reward to Austria for all the good that she's done the church, hell will pursue him to the very end. So you've got to get everyone you know to pray for him. Well, the priest did just that. And that was the beginning of the organization we call today the Gebetsliga, the Kaiser League of Prayer. It began not pursuing his beatification. It began while he was a little boy praying for his well-being. And then when he became emperor, of course, they redoubled their prayers. When he died, that was when they switched to pursuing his uh, beatification and, and now his canonization. But it's, it's a very bizarre story. Quite a bizarre one. We also hope that our organization, the CRC, will one day join the Gebets Liga, but unfortunately, they're a little bit uh, slow on their decisions. Uh, now let's uh, come to the second question regarding Blessed Charles, and that's uh, his life as a monarch. Uh, especially, uh, we are going to concentrate ourselves on these uh, two years of his reign. Uh, first, there's the death of Franz Josef, and we shook the monarchy. Uh, generations were born and died during his reign. He was the sign of stability, law, of prosperity, all our city centers in Central Europe that uh, are built on the former Count Ka monarchy are built during his period. And now we have the first World War or the Great War it, uh, as it was known, 
and we have blessed Charles. Uh, we know his first act as a monarch was quite a strange one, and some conservative uh, circles in both Austria and Hungary didn't expect this, and that was during his coronation. Uh, by the time we had only two agreements, which were practically the constitution of the monarchy. First was the Austrian-Hungarian compromise, and then was the Hungarian-Croatian compromise. It, it, those documents set a couple of laws that defined the nature of uh, the monarchy, as well as even coronations. No. And the first thing, thing he done, he broke it. He introduced a Croatian royal oath beside a Hungarian one. He also uh, had the uh, old Croatian rights introduced, and we have this as the last official Catholic uh, coronation. And as I would say, uh, if there is some uh, love in history and uh, God to our all nations, let Croatians and Hungarians the last ones to crown a Catholic king be the first one to do it in this year. But Please God. Please God. <laughs> Praise God, yes. <laughs> but uh, let's begin with uh, his reign. So what was uh, strange about his reign? Did he follow the footsteps of the murdered uh, Franz Ferdinand or was he keen on uh, having the status quo of Franz Josef? What was his reign? Well, he, Franz Ferdinand, uh, and this again, you know, he, uh, he had had to deal with parents who didn't care for each other. Well, when he was heir to the throne, he had to deal with both Franz Ferdinand and Franz Josef, his great uncle and his uncle. Now, he understood why his great uncle wanted just the status quo, because the status quo had taken a lot of uh, pain and horror to achieve. 1848, uh, the terrible rebellions of that year in, in uh, Hungary and Austria and all around, uh, 1866 and the terrible war with Prussia, the Ausgleich in 1867, these were difficult to navigate through. So when, the, when it was all finished and Austria-Hungary was set up as it was, Franz Josef just wanted it left alone. Franz Ferdinand, on the other hand, very, very different. Uh, oh, and also I should mention that in foreign policy, having been beaten by the Germans, by the Prussians, Franz Josef was quite content to be allied with them, uh, figuring that was the, as it were, the path of least resistance. Franz Ferdinand had very, very different ideas. Uh, externally, although he was on personally on very good terms with Kaiser Wilhelm, he didn't trust the Germans. And he believed that Austria being tied to them was a recipe for disaster. Uh, he looked to Russia, he looked to Britain, he even looked uh, to some degree to France as a possibility. Uh, certainly a real, an alliance between Britain and Russia would have uh, been enough to keep Germany and France quiet, at least he hoped so. Uh, the, uh, in terms of his internal policy, he wanted to federalize the empire and not just the Austrian half, but also Hungary. And that would have meant a separate and autonomous Croatia, uh, a Transylvania uh, with equal representation on the part of Romanians, uh, Magyars and Germans in, in uh, Transylvania, uh, Bohemia, Galicia, all the parts of the empire that was so divided. Here we he can wanted... see also the map. Uh, he had a couple, of course, uh... I mean, I, I wouldn't uh, say he had, uh, since the, there were a couple of circles around the court yeah. of Franz Ferdinand, which uh, he also uh, advocated. They had a couple of, yeah, from Popovich's federalization to yes. uh, this map. I hope you can see it. And this is something called Karl's federalization, which would include the already existing uh, legal kingdoms giving them uh, full autonomy and in them there would be also smaller autonomy. For example, Transylvania would uh, still be there. Uh, the only problem was, of course, uh, the law that uh, he gave during the oath, uh, that was the on, on the integrity of the Hungarian crown. Can you tell us more about that law? And we shall also here present another realistic also maps and talk about those solutions as well. 
All right. Well, basically, uh, part of the problem, I mentioned 1848. Now, in 1848, a big chunk of the Hungarians revolted under the leadership of uh, Louis Kossuth. And they were, to be blunt, Republicans. They wanted a Republic of Hungary, and they wanted to toss out the Habsburgs. Well, the minorities of Hungary, the Croats under uh, your great Ban Jelacic, the Serbs, believe it or not, the Romanians, the Slovaks, they all rallied to the dynasty in 1848. Even then, it wasn't enough, uh, despite all of them and the loyal Hungarians, it wasn't enough to suppress the revolution. And so Russia intervened on the side of the, uh, of the Habsburgs. Well, afterwards, um, Franz Josef made, I think, two terrible mistakes. The first, uh, in 1853, when Russia was facing uh, Britain and uh, France in the Crimean War, Oh, we're in a very nice place now. I like this. The, uh, I, I wish we were here. This is great. Uh, anyway, so uh, when that happened, uh, the Russians asked Austria to return the favor. Now, the truth is there wasn't much the British and the French could have done to Austria. But Franz Joseph insisted on staying neutral, and he lost Russia as an ally. As a result, when... He had to face Russia, or, uh, Prussia, Sardinia, and France at different times. He did so alone. And the result was the defeat of 1866. And that, in turn, required a deal with the Magyars. And that was the Ausgleich of 1867. Okay. The problem inherent in that settlement was that if the Hungarian government were dominated by the Catholic Party, the Zichis and so forth, the leaders of that, fine. They had, they were, shall we say, very sympathetic to the Hungarian nationalities. But the liberals under the Tisza clan, very different story. They were keen on modernizing all of the uh, ethnic minorities in Hungary. And that was a problem that simmered all the way to the end. So, when Franz Ferdinand wanted to federalize the empire, he, um, and, and it's a great myth, by the way, that he hated the Hungarians. He did not, not at all. In fact, one of his closest friends, uh, Father Joseph Lani, baptized his children and all that, taught him Hungarian. No, no, Franz Ferdinand had no dislike of the Magyars, but he didn't like the Tisas and he didn't like the liberals, not in the slightest. So, uh, when he died, he had been very much Karl's mentor in matters political, to a degree religious. He was also a devotee of the sacred art and also domestic. Uh, if you want to know the example that Karl and Zita followed, look at Franz Ferdinand and Sophie. They were the only happy couple they knew. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> now Tisa, by 1916, uh, he was in complete control of Hungary and also of the biggest part of the empire's grain supply. So what he basically told uh, Karl was that unless you're crown king of Hungary, we're not going to follow you. And of course, if you're crown king of Hungary, you've got to take an oath to the constitution. So that was it. His hands were sort of bound, although as you rightly point out, he introduced Croatian elements and brought in the Croatian oath, which was also a reminder, I think, to Tisa and everyone else that if Hungary was Austria's equal partner, then Croatia was Hungary's. There, so, there is also a similar thing uh, which has also echoes in today's politics. For example, uh, we see that uh, Tisa's influence was especially uh, there uh, regarding Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was at the time a condemn, uh, that was at the time uh, a separate part uh, ruled by the Ministry of Finance and mostly had Hungarian influences in there. And there was, of course, uh, one of uh, Hungarian most uh, influential uh, governors, and that was Kalai. Uh, he had uh, this idea, for example, that there would be no nationalities in uh, Hungary itself, no Slovaks, no Serbs, etc. 
In Croatia, okay, they may be uh, Croats, and that was under, of course, uh, the notorious Banquin Hedervari, who was later also Prime Minister of Hungary, but uh, they introduced also that Serbs are constitutional part so that Croatians would share power. But in Bosnia Herzegovina, they did something else. Uh, since there were two peoples only in three faiths, Croats and uh, Serbs and uh, Muslims, Catholics and Orthodox, uh, the Muslims were uh, divided. Most of them were, of course, especially the intellectual parts uh, uh, they tie themselves with uh, Croats, especially the Resulema of Sarajevo and the uh, intellectual leaders. Uh, some were also uh, keen to post service, but the minority was uh, for autonomy. And they had uh, the friend, they had a quite a friend in Tisa, and that was that they create a separate nationality that would be around Bosniaks, Bosnians and uh, the language. For example, we know the, lang the Bosnian language created in the 19th century was done by a Croat uh, grammar teacher who didn't want to sign the book because he said it was uh, a Serbo-Croatian or croat serb language. But in the end, that's something which is also in effect uh, a problem in today's Bosnia-Herzegovina, those uh, now not, not free uh, religions, but free nations problem. And Tisa is someone who advocated uh, not a solution, but uh, quite the opposite uh, point of breaking for Bosnia and Herzegovina, which would destabilize the monarchy. Why would you say uh, Tisa used uh, this middle ground for both Austrian side and Hungarian side to uh, disrupt uh, uh, some central uh, parts in instability of the monarchy? Well, it certainly, uh, it certainly kept the emperor busy, didn't it? Uh, you know, Tiso is an interesting character. He's not one of my favorites. Uh, you know, he's, he's up there with, uh, with uh, Horthy and um, uh, uh, Chernin and various other characters from the, the late empire. And of course, the, the evil Karl Renner. Uh, I mean... Charles, I think we have a connection, a little problem. Okay, we can see you now. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you in here. You can continue now. All right. Yeah, uh, Tisa was very much a Magyar nationalist. And that is, you know, I think it was Eric von Kuder. I think it's important in Central Europe, in multinational Central Europe. And that is the difference between a patriot and a nationalist. Uh, a patriot loves all the peoples of his country simply because they're in his country. A nationalist wants everyone in his country to be like himself. So the example he used, a Bohemian patriot, for instance, would have loved both Czechs, Sudeten Germans, and the House of Habsburg, because together that's what made Bohemia. Whereas a Sudeten German or a Czech nationalist would want Bohemia simply to be Czech or German. And the, the, the irony in a certain sense, again, thinking back to 1848, is that in a lot of ways, especially given the Kosovo and the gang were fighting for a republic, the Slovaks and Serbs and Croats and Romanians who fought for the Habsburgs were actually fighting for the crowd of St. Stephen because they were fighting for the, for the traditional constitution of Hungary. And that's something I don't think that anybody, Hungarians, Slovaks, uh, Romanians, etc., I don't think anybody ever looks at it that way. But it's true. It's absolutely true. So at any rate, the, the sad bit with Tisa's story is that in the end he got what he wanted in a sense. Hung the Hungarians became masters in their own house. Of course they lost three quarters of the country. And then he what? himself, what's that? Uh, the, 
one of the most interesting parts about his biography is that the last thing he could do, of course, since he resided at his post as a prime minister and Weckerle took over, which was prone to reforms and tried to save the monarchy, which we'll talk about later. And of course, uh, uh, movements that didn't want to establish Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia and wanted for both Czechia to remain uh, in Croatia in the monarchy. But interesting, in 1917, when uh, Tisa went on a tour for Bosnia and Herzegovina, of course, he went for Slavonia, Croatia, and there he wanted to meet with religious leaders to once again rekindle the old idea of uh, uh, creating a new Bosnian nations, uh, regardless of them being Croats and Serbs. So at the time, the governor was, of course, Sarkotic, who was the main uh, a figure or puppet figure or let us say great eminence of the whole trialist movement uh, uh, in regards to blessed uh, uh, Charles and during that time when Tisa went he visited also the main monasteries and uh, my ancestor or uh, my brother of my ancestor uh, Fra Ante Brešić Plemenit Mikulić from who I also have the name he was the provincial uh, definitor of Bosnia Argentina or Bosnia Srebrenica and Croatia. And he asked him, uh, well, uh, can you tell me, can we make here a new nation, a new language? And he said, there are only two nations, three faiths, and I'm sorry, but none of them are Hungarian like. <laughs> well, that that's uh, sad. And of course, I say the, the sad thing about Tisa was the way he ended his life was ended because of course um in the wake of the uh, overthrow of the Habsburgs in Hungary you have the communist government of Bela Kun and it was Bela Kun's thugs who murdered Tisa which he certainly did not deserve um and that you know one thing that's it's again it's easy to find villains in this in this terrible story but it's important to remember that there were also heroes there were people, Borevich comes to mind, but certainly Hungarians like Lehar, uh, Austrians like Zestner Spitzenberg, every nationality of the empire, even there were Italians in Trentino of all places that stayed loyal to Kaiser Karl to the very end. And that's important to remember. It wasn't all betrayal. There, there's um, also the case of Masaryk, if I remember, uh, who once when he had the opportunity to talk with uh, Otto von Habsburg, our crown prince and sadly never reigning uh, king and emperor, uh, when he visited him, he said, did you know that I was loyal to the end? I, I was loyal until even November when uh, uh, the emperor uh, had leased me out of my uh, royal oath. So we can even see Republican politicians in those countries who advocated uh, finally, or at least led the countries during the dissolution of the Count Khan monarchy, that they, they had, uh, I would not say education, I would not say upbringing, but sort of commitment to the common crown. And that's something uh, which is not used for multinational countries. And I think it's something that was quite unique for Austria-Hungary. For example, we do not have those uh, kinds of... Uh, cases in the Russian monarchy, and that's something I would like to open now as our second sub-question. Uh, how can we uh, see uh, the influence of Blessed Charles uh, and the Great War on the Austrian politics or Eastern po uh, European politics in regards uh, to both Ukraine, Belarus, Baltic states, etc.? Well, that's a, a very broad issue because, of course, at the same time that Austria-Hungary was going through its death throes, so too, a little earlier, had, had uh, Imperial Russia. Now, despite the efforts of uh, Alexander I, who was the Tsar at the time of Napoleon and after, who had himself made Grand Duke of Finland and King of Poland and all that, and honestly attempted to preserve the institutions of those peoples, uh, that was not the case later on. Now, also to be fair, there were several Polish revolts and you can get arguments backwards and forwards as to who was right and who was wrong. 
But suffice to say that at the end of the day, uh, up until 1905, from about 1890 something, uh, there were heavy Russification uh, efforts on the uh, on the part of the Russians with the Ukrainians and Belarusians and so on. Also, the other thing to bear in mind is that uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was Poland, Lithuania, and a big chunk of what's now Ukraine and Belarus. Uh, in 1596, most of their Orthodox uh, people became Catholic in the Union of Brest. And that was the beginning of the Ukrainian, Ruthenian, and Belarusian Catholic, Greek Catholic churches. Uh, and they stayed Catholic uh, after the partition of Poland, which saw a lot of them come under um, Russia, some under Austria, Galicia. They were really the beginning of the of a sort of Ukrainian national consciousness. But in 1831, there was a big revolt in Poland by the Latin Catholic Poles against the Russians. And after it was suppressed, Tsar Nicholas I suppressed the Eastern Catholic churches in his territory. And that, as you can imagine, led to later problems. Um, Later on, you have World War One, and the collapse of the Russian Empire. And Finland, the Baltic countries, Ukraine, Belarus, initially they become German client states, German Austrian client states. Uh, and then after the, the defeat of the central powers, they have to try to defend themselves against the resurgent communist Russia, which Ukrainians and Belarusians fail to do for the most part. <clears throat> they were defeated, the Poles taking over the western portions of those countries. And then Stalin, when he became the dictator, uh, formed the autonomous uh, Soviet Socialist Republics, in which Ukraine was one. Now, to try to cement the Ukrainians to Russia, he added a district, the Donbass, to Ukraine. And later in the 50s, Khrushchev would do the same with Crimea. And initially, it's interesting, the first capital of the Ukrainian SSR was not Kiev. It was Kharkov, because it was much further east and more Russian. Well, in other words, all of the ethnic problems and the fighting that happened then and were exacerbated in World War II where you were faced, for instance, with, in Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, they're all occupied by the Germans and their resistance forces occasionally collaborate, but they also attack each other. Sometimes they even attack each other's civilians. It was a real mess. Um, <clears throat> a lot of bitterness came out of it, as you might expect. So then, World War II is over, the Soviet Union asserts itself, it takes over uh, the Belarus and Ukrainian parts of Poland. The Ukrainians continue a guerrilla war, as do the Lithuanians, from 1945 into the 50s. Think about that, that's you know, 12 years they fought without any hope, but they kept fighting. It tells you something about them. All right, so, Communism fell, those countries became independent again. But after communism fell in 1991, as we know, the West pursued a very different uh, direction. Uh, we became woke to a degree even worse than we've been before. We became, uh, well, our, our fathers would have called us extremely corrupt. And that allowed Putin in the past 10 years to pose as the defender of traditional Christian values. And that, that was what his rhetoric was all about. And that rhetoric was one of the reasons he was so hated in the West. And this is why a lot of Western conservatives backed him because they saw him as the only major leader who wasn't in favor of uh, abortion and euthanasia and gay marriage and gender fluidity and all this good stuff, <clears throat> which has come for many Westerners 
has come to mean Western values. <laughs> there's, well, interesting, interesting, there's an sorry? interesting fact that one of the first persons in uh, Central Europe who uh, saw through Putin uh, that he was uh, something uh, like a fraud was Otto von Habsburg and he had uh, interesting lectures and interviews in 2003 and 2005. Uh, there will be also presented in the leak, uh, links with other uh, sources for our viewers. He said that uh, he's uh, nice for the West, especially for Germany. He uh, wants uh, German-Russian uh, 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 good relations. He also talks about Christianity, etc. But when we look at uh, Putin, uh, there's something odd. Uh, first of all, we have the traditional and the Christian side of Russia who turned the back on him during this war and that's uh, mainly because of the Romanovs. We have now again a split in the Russian Orthodox Church, whether a uh, metropolit of the Russian Orthodox Church out of, outside of Russia accepts the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, uh, Hilarion. On the next, on the other hand, we have the metropolit of Moscow who doesn't and who also advocates war. Uh, there's and all of this mess I can uh, put on in two sentences. Russia has always two ways out. First is the European way and that's something the Romanos advocated and especially that was good during the large alliances of uh, uh, of uh, Prussia, uh, Austria-Hungary, Habsburg monarchy and Russia. They preserved the conservative Europe. On the other hand, there's something especially now under Dugin's ideology called Euro-Asianism, which is something that Russia is going on. And it uses both uh, Bolshevism and the nationalism uh, in a sense to unite them. We have now, uh, we had the consecration of a large cathedral near Moscow full of Bolshevik symbols. You had, uh, uh, you had uh, mosa mosaics with Mary leading Bolsheviks to war. That's something from a Christian point of view uh, not normal to see. It would uh, almost seem possible with our theology. How would you it's, comment it's not, this uh, view of Putin? Is he uh, truly a defender of Christian uh, conservative values or is he just another fraud who is using both nationalism and Bolshevism to put on his agenda? Well, Speaking as a speaking as an American, where all of our politicians have usually used faith one way or the other, regardless of what they were, it would be a it would be almost a shock to me if we were sincere just because it's a politician. But that's not fair. Uh, honestly, until the invasion, I couldn't have told him because I can't read his mind. What I can say is that had he not done this. I have absolutely no doubt that in 10 years he would have been the most powerful politician in Europe. I have no doubt at all in my mind. But having done this, and worse yet, having, I knew when he invaded that if it wasn't a quick victory, then all of the problems in the Russian military would be exposed for the world to see, which would not be a great benefit for Russia. You know, a weapon is only good if it's effective. Um, and I, and I, and honestly, I'm not, I'm not happy about it. It's sort of a, you know, I, I was telling a friend the other day in with, uh, I've got a lot of friends who are fighting in Ukraine right now. So I'm a little, you know, I'm happy about that. And I love Russia, so I'm not happy about that. But in the mix of emotions, I determined there was one other one, disappointment. And it was disappointment in that on one level, I guess, I kind of hoped Putin knew what he was doing. And this whole tobacco shows that he really isn't much different than the rest of them, except in his rhetoric. And of course, it hasn't escaped me. And this goes back to the question of Central Europe. It hasn't escaped me that at the very moment that Poland and Hungary we're accepting the majority of Ukrainian refugees. The European Parliament attacked them. This is monstrous. But it also shows that between Putin and Western Europe, 
Central Europe can really only trust itself. And that would be our next question, since uh, there's an interesting fact. Uh, the contemporary Ur Ukraine, of course, uh, Ukrainians are our fellow people. We lived with them for centuries in the Count Kham monarchy. They were known also as Ruthenians or Rusins. Uh, Ukrainians is just another name, as well as uh, the, the Belarusians and the Russians of Moscow and Novogrod took their own name for the centuries. It's a process. But it's interesting, the contemporary Ukraine was created on the basis of that, uh, that uh, Central Europe. And the first Ukrainian state was a monarchy, which is not uh, known. It was the Hetman state with the Hetman uh, dynasty of Skoropadovsky, but uh, also uh, whose uh, descendants I even met and have as uh, online acquaintances. Uh, we, we thought that the dynasty died out, but they're still here. That's quite something. And that will, we'll talk about it more in the future. But there were two solutions. For example, the Catholic, Greek Catholic uh, Metropolit, uh, he said that uh, one of the Archdukes of the Habsburg family, this uh, was born in Veli Loshini, Wilhelm Habsburg, uh, who took on the name Vasily, took on his uh, Ukrainian identity and even has fallen as a martyr uh, of the Ukrainian state by the uh, communists and Bolsheviks, and it was fought, fought uh, to be lost for dozens of years only with the fall of the, uh, the designation, the fall of the uh, Soviet Union was his death uh, more widely known. But we have here two concepts, also one with Poland. Uh, it seems that uh, and these were all not uh, questions put on the table by France uh, Joseph, they were put on the table by uh, Blessed Charles. Yes. Why did Blessed Charles think that a monarchy, especially a Christian one, could be a stable future for those countries? For example, uh, the Germans uh, were not uh, keen on monarchy. They only wanted monarchy in uh, maybe Finland or Baltic states, Baltic states, but in Belarus or Ukraine or even Poland, they're indifferent to it. How come the uh, Blessed Charles was keen on uh, creating, if he can, a Catholic, if not a Catholic, at least a Christian monarchy? Is that uh, system uh, much more stable? Is, is it that the governing head is much more sincere about his uh, reign than uh, other typical politicians are? And how can you relate this to the future of Central and Eastern Europe today? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, firstly, I, uh, he knew, certainly in himself, that a monarch, especially in an area that's very divided ethnically, religiously, culturally, uh, needs a sort of honest broker who can rise above the, uh, the ethnic differences. And certainly the Habsburgs had a huge amount of uh, experience with that. The only other country in the area that had something similar was the old Pol Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, whose last royal family, the Agielos, died out. Uh, but the Habsburgs, of course, inherited the female line, like they inherited from everybody else in the female line. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, it's interesting, too, that prior to World War I, there were Polish conservatives in Krakow, who uh, was a party of them, who wanted to resurrect Poland, all right, but under the Habsburg monarchy, with either the emperor or as king of Poland, the way he was king of Hungary, or another Habsburg as king of Poland, and ditto Lithuania, and so the eastern countries, Ukraine, Belarus. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that these areas have much more in common on the one hand with each other than they do with their neighbors, and never more than now. Uh, but on the other hand, they're riven with intense hatreds. So a Christian monarch is in a position to rise above it, to pull them together and to get them to strive together for their common good. And that had helped them overcome their past hatreds. I mean, you know, every, every people from the Baltic to the Adriatic to the, uh, to the Aegean 
Every people in Central and Eastern Europe has its heroes and its martyrs. But very often, the heroes of one group created the martyrs of the other. And that, you see, everyone remembers what was done to them. Nobody ever remembers what they did to the others. No, 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 no. We were always put upon. It's all those evil peoples. But you see, a king, an emperor is able to say, uh, no, no, no. We've got to pull together now, my children, especially in the face of a common enemy. Once that enemy was the Ottoman Empire. Today, at the moment, it's Russia and the West, two sides. And as I say, that was never more epitomized than by than by uh, the European Parliament's recent actions. Imagine, if you will, and I ask you to use your imagination, that you had a number of the countries of Central Europe, uh, Austria, Hungary, Czechia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Croatia, maybe Poland, maybe toss in a couple of others, in a sort of monarchical federation with a common defense, security policy, foreign policy, as much subsidiarity as possible internally. That is to say, at the local level, provincial, national, and with a monarch above it all to serve both as a focus of unity and as an ombudsman, as well as commander in chief of the forces. Um, and rooted in both the religious and cultural and historical traditions of the peoples. Such an entity, such a body, uh, could do, this could be either in or out of the EU, but if it was inside the EU, it would be on its own terms, not Brussels. It would be able to face the Russians, it would be able to face the West, and it would do more than that, because it could be both an example and a catalyst for similar improvements and change in the rest of Europe and in Russia. You know, Archie Grotto, sorry? There's something which I can tell uh, about that idea that it's almost there. For example, uh, my father's generation that fought in the homeland war that brought Croatia back to Central Europe and the Mediterranean and pushed us off Yugoslavia and the whole uh, Eastern or how we say here, Byzantine influence or neo-Byzantine influence. Uh, their generation didn't thought about it. They they love the idea, but my generation already can see it. We have a, a army uh, alliances built upon Central Europe, the Central European Defense Corporation. We also have two political, economic, and cultural alliances. One is of course the Visegrad Union. Uh, I'm of course uh, also said that uh, our uh, president during the 90s, Tujman, uh, pushed that idea off the table because he thought Croatia was more developed than those countries and now we are falling back behind. That's why if he if he had listened to Otto, we wouldn't be pushed back aside. And the other is, of course, the Austerlitz format, he's, who says he's not, uh, of course, there to uh, change Visegrad, but also uh, is there to pick up other other states like Austria, Slovenia, and Croatia. Uh, there is something forming here. Uh, a good idea is that the Trimarium uh, idea or the Free Seas Initiative has fallen down because it's also a later uh, interbellum idea which could never work. It's, it was just a shield for American interests in Europe. But a stronger Central Europe Europe cooperation, uh, I think it needs Ukraine now more than it needs ever. And it's not only because of resources like grain or the second the largest gas and oil reserves found in Europe that were found in 2012 and of course are the economic, uh, economic uh, push for this war, but there are 40 million uh, Ukrainians who are uh, more or less much more conservative than their Western counterparts. And seeing 40 million people join some de somewhere where they feel they belong and that's Central Europe could resurrect that old idea because every other idea will come to the point of duality where you have the West and the East. And in cases of ideologies of both Western and Eastern, 
parts, I think we are all doomed. And when we are now talking about being doomed, uh, our, my second question on this subject comes to the consecration of Russia. First, uh, do you believe that previous consecration attempts uh, did fulfill uh, uh, the needed requirements put uh, upon our lady, our queen of heavens, or do you think this is the first time or maybe even not? And why is this consecration important even if it is not taken upon uh, uh, the Queen of Heavens herself uh, and received with good blessings. Why should this consecration now matter? Well, a couple of reasons. Firstly, uh, for those who aren't aware, Our Lady appeared at Fatima in 1917. And of course, this was a crucial year in Europe and the world. Uh, the consecration to which you refer, uh, Our Lady requested of Sister Lucy, and the Pope was supposed to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in union with all the bishops of the world. Now, there have been several attempts uh, to do that, but, and again, I am not an expert and I'm not going to pretend that anything I'm going to say on this matter is infallible. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, you're not a Catholic and you're going to hell. End of story. No, I'm not going to tell you that. So I'll tell you my understanding of it. Uh, always subject to uh, correction by people who might know more than I do. Yes, they do exist. I know for any writer to admit that such people are, are around, but they do, trust me. Seriously, um, I do not believe that up to this up to this path, up to this time, it had been performed in the way that Our Lady had asked for. Now, there were attempts at consecration made. I'm sure they had some sort of effect because no prayer goes un unheard. It may be they're part of the reason why the Soviet Union fell. But that's not the same thing as the conversion of Russia. It certainly was a great help. It gave us 30 years of semi-peace in Europe. Um, it allowed Other than the other than the wars in in former Yugoslavia, uh, other than that, there was peace. Um, but this consecration, it's not. It's closer than anything has been done. Whether or not it's precisely what heaven required, we'll find out. But it was the first time that all the bishops of the world were asked to do it at the same time. And a lot of them did, apparently. Um, I, I would just like to point out that every bishop conference was in attendance. Yeah. It's something which was not expected, but also none. Uh, also, every uh, priestly society, yep. which is in canonical union, but also ones that are not. We also have bishops of the SSPX who also yes. Uh, did participate in the consecration, which is quite a uh, large achievement. Uh, the, we, we, may, the, we may say that the Pope, this Pope uh, has his ups and downs, especially we who follow a certain tradition in the Catholic Church. But well, would this be well, also the highest point of his pontificate? Well, you see, uh, there's the point. Um, number one, he's already done something that no conservative pope could have done without being ripped to shreds by the press. And that was canonizing St. Junipero Serra. Um, he's certainly not one of my favorite people. No, no, not Father Serra. I love him. The Holy Father is not one of my favorite people. I'm not going to pretend he is. But having said that, it may be um, in the design of heaven that he was the only prelate who could get away with it given his reputation, etc. Uh, I mean, one thing you'll find when you study the history of the papacy is that even the worst popes played a part. So probably the worst ever, for my money, John XII, who was just awful in every way, nevertheless confirmed the charter of the Abbey of Cluny, thus unwittingly 
opening the uh, the door for a new uh, a new chapter of reform in the church. I'm sure he didn't put two bits of thought to it, but he's the one who did it. So what I there is a mystery in the papacy. As I say, even the worst of them play their part. Uh, if it hadn't been for the really awful Julius III, we wouldn't have had St. Pius V. But you only know that in retrospect. When you're living through it, it's a little different. So I would not be surprised to find that this, in fact, was what was required. And that God used this man the way he's used other popes I didn't particularly like anyway. Uh, that doesn't mean they were evil. It just means I didn't like them. The two are not the same. Let's make that clear. Just because I don't like someone or something doesn't mean it's necessarily evil. That's important to bear in mind. Uh, but it could very well be that things have worked this way out of some vast heavenly design. Uh, one thing is certain, it wouldn't have happened if Russia had not invaded Ukraine. There's no way that the bishops of the world or the Pope himself would have been that frightened otherwise. I mean, often enough, they spoke about how difficult in the old days, how difficult it would be to get all the bishops to agree to consecrate Russia, especially when the Soviet Union was uh, in full swing. That would have been a very, very difficult thing to do, which is probably why they didn't do it. Um, but now, it's a whole other story. So we'll see. I mean, obviously, the by their fruits, you shall know them, our Lord tells us. So I have no particular judgment on whether or not this is the thing, because I don't know the results. If the, if the results are positive, then I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, yep, that was it. On the other hand, if not, I'll say, ah, no, he didn't didn't know what it was doing. Whatever, whichever you'll notice, I was right all the time. There's See, also, I am a man of my age. <laughs> there's also a problem that, uh, especially among our Catholic brothers, that they uh, sometimes forget how God's creation works. Oh. They can see it all around them. They can see how plants flower. They can see how child uh, is born out of the womb. And it always takes a process. And oh. first thing I see, some of course, not many, but our Catholic uh, conservative or traditional circle said, oh, where, where, where is the peace? Where is the end of war? And I say to them, uh, a magician is a false prophet, a false uh, icon, uh, because he gives you something like whoop. Oh. It's not how God creates. That's not how God works. Uh, and we have to wait for it. For, for example, the consecration of the world done by St. John Paul II. Uh, of course, it said that he didn't mention uh, Russia. Uh, of course, uh, you cannot also place um, uh, pure uh, advocate semantics with Our Lady. You cannot say, ah, it's part of the world. It's not the same. But in the end, it had some uh, good things. Uh, the communist system did fall, but it was never rooted out. It's still implemented no, no. in this system which uh, Putin governs. So it's not rooted out, but there are uh, gifts of faith. There, there are. And I mean, see, again, part of the problem is we don't live long enough to really understand what's going on. We live only a very short time, really, and we all expect everything to be accomplished like that. Also, another thing to remember, and this is important, especially in the light of Kaiser Karl, if there was ever a problem with the world today, it's a lack of decent leadership. I mean, that is our biggest loss. It's what we don't have. But we had one of the most decent leaders ever, 100 years ago, and we killed him. And I say we because my president had as big a role in his destruction as anyone else, more than most. So at the end of the day, we'll only really know what it all meant at the uh, final judgment. All we can do in the immediate is our own duty, the best we can from what we can see. But you know, 
Archduke Otto used to say something that is always in my mind, especially looking at, as, as I say, Central Europe as a bloc, not simply for its own sake, but for the effect it might have on the rest of the European thing. And what Otto said was, Europe actually extends from San Francisco to Vladivostok. And that's very true. Um, we don't like to look at it that way. Americans like to pretend that we're autogenetic and somehow managed to be here all by ourselves. <laughs> Who knows how we got here, but we're here. Uh, Europeans very often like to, oh, well, you know, those colonials. Her, her, her. Well, no, they're both wrong. And the same is true with Canada and Australia and Russia. And Otto was one of the very, very few statesmen of his time or any other who saw that. Uh, I really, I really can say that probably the great, the second greatest loss to Central Europe, Europe as a whole, in the world, uh, with Karl's defeat, was that his son didn't succeed him. Otto was really the, the greatest emperor we never had. And that's something that Otto himself would have wanted. Uh, I had the pleasure to meet him a couple of times uh, as I was quite younger then. And for him, even, even though I should have met him for at least one minute, he talked to me for almost 20 minutes and his yeah. argument was uh, uh, quite mad of him because he never he he was fascinated that there were peoples in their teen, uh, late teens and early twenties that are monarchists. Uh, he he never so he he told me one thing that I will never for, forgive. He said, "If monarchy comes back, if the the alte monarchy comes zurück, it wird in Kroatien sein und nicht in Österreich. If the old monarchy ever returns, it will never be in uh, Austria but in Croatia." And <laughs> There were only a couple of us. Uh, for us, uh, I was just getting used to, to calling myself monarchist because at the time people told you, ah, if you're a monarchist, there's the loony for you. Uh, now, of course, it's different. But uh, in the shadow of the centenary of Karl's death, we can truly see the impact uh, of uh, saint's reign. And in the end, uh, something I always tell to people, we are often call, uh, telling ourselves, ah, what should the monarch be? He should be tall, he should be handsome, he should be strong, he should be dead, he should be conservative, etc., etc. But I, I always say, what's the people he's going to govern? For example, uh, as a Croat, what are we Croats today that we deserve a saint? Uh. My grand grandfather had a saint for his king, and look how it ended up. And that's a question we should also ask ourselves in the future. So since we have almost 10 to 15 minutes left, uh, we'll get on the subject of Catholic devotion to Karl and especially the case of the servant of God, our dear Queen Zita. Uh, first, let's talk about her personal life and then her Catholic devotion and why should we pray for her to be sanctified? Well, she was very, very, very much his helpmate. And she, um, how do I put it? She spent the rest of her life trying to keep his vision alive and trying to keep alive the integrity of the House of Habsburg and to make sure that her children would grow up as devout Catholics. Um, her um, her methods were, by our standards, sometimes a bit bizarre. They spoke a different language of the empire every day. One day German, one day Magyar, one day Croat, you know, just around the, you know, on a regular rota around the week. Uh, she was very demanding of them, but she always had the memory of her husband and the duty, both as his wife and as his queen, two separate things that she had to maintain. Uh, very, very feminine, but tough as nails. And she had to be. Uh, the story, for instance, of how they escaped the Nazis in 1940, you could make a movie about that because they were living in Belgium. And the um, 
the king of Bel the Belgians, Leopold III, he said, he called them and he said, the Germans are invading, you better get out of Dodge because they want you. So they fled through collapsing France. And the funny thing was, as they fled, they would stop at different places. And they started out with three cars full, the family, servants, and so on, and three cars. Every place they stopped, there would be Austrian refugees, a lot of them Jews, who were also fleeing towards Spain. And as soon as they saw that the Habsburgs were there, they joined them. By the time they got to the Spanish border, they had about 250 people with them. But this presented a problem. The border was sealed. How do we get across? And they couldn't leave the people that had joined them. Well, this is where God took a hand. After the uh, they were rescued from Madeira by the King of Spain, they had lived on the northern coast of Spain for eight years and then moved to Belgium. Well, the, the uh, head of the border control at the spot that they showed up had been the chief of police of the town they lived in. And so he knew them and he let the whole bunch in. The family, the servants, and all these refugees. He let them all into Spain. And then they, uh, they drove to Lisbon and uh, took a ship to the United States. Uh, now, the reason why they were able to go there, and that's an interesting story, is that Otto had been very keen on following the rise of the Nazis. And in fact, he had gone to ostensibly to study in Berlin in 1932. And he was there watching them. He was there when Hitler took power and he immediately got out of Dodge. He fled the country as soon as Hitler took over. But he had already established all sorts of connections with anti-Nazi resistance in Germany. And he came out with an awful lot of information. He brought that information to Walter Bullitt the American ambassador in Paris and gave it to him about Nazi plans for the future and so on, a lot of other things. Bullet in turn gave it to Roosevelt, our president at the time. And Roosevelt said, you tell that young man, if he ever needs a place to stay, he's welcome to the United States. And that's why the Habsburgs were able to go to America in World War II. Also, there's uh, unfortunately a sad fact because at the time uh, Franco's Spain uh, was quite uh, in the hands of uh, uh, aid from Germany. And Franco, who admired through his life Otto von Habsburg, even uh, there were talks, of course, that was never official that Otto should be king of Spain. Uh, oh. He uh, opened up those ways that he traveled outside of uh, Spain, of course, into the United States because the pressure of the Nazis to take the Habsburgs was truly high. Uh, of course, since we all know that Hitler was born in Austria, uh, he, he wanted to join the Academy of the Fine Arts and yeah, I he, uh... say that our artists, if they do not uh, get uh, into the academy at the first time, please don't go to war. <laughs> no, no, please do something else. It's, do something you know, else. It's I tried not... a couple of times and it all went uh, great, so never lose hope. But in the end, uh, Hitler was not that angry on Kaiser Wilhelm as he was on the Habsburgs. He could not oh, uh, uh, stand them, especially he, there is a combination of his hatred of the Catholic Church, of the multiculturalism uh, of the monarchy, and that's something he could not handle. Well, he hated it, and he also hated them as aristocrats. You know, he had, he had, had a, uh, a grunt job at a hotel where Carl and Zita appeared when they were uh, before World War I. He saw them, and he hated them. You know, he wasn't lying when he said he was National Socialist. The, th the thing about socialism, the key to socialism is bearing in mind that it's envy. It's a little bit like uh, Karl Renner, who was the socialist uh, demagogue who ruined Kaiser Karl in Austria. He was one of 18 children uh, from a family that were ruined because they owned a vineyard and the agricultural crisis destroyed it. So they were in very bad shape. But his education was financed by a local nobleman. 
Now, when someone does that for you, there are two possible responses. One is gratitude, but the other, and Carl Renner chose this route, is envy and resentment. And that, unfortunately, human nature is not always nice, contrary to what we like to tell ourselves. Anyhow. And there's also, uh, I would say, a uh, Freudian problem. Freud would, of course, agree, but right. uh, not to get into the Freud stuff. Uh, well, something Americans call now in their, uh, I would say, TikTok uh, psychology, <laughs> daddy issues. Uh, all of them had also quite uh, big uh, father problems. Uh, for example, uh, the resentment for its uh, authority, monarchy, traditionalism in Hitler's side was because his father was uh, a Habsburg civil servant. Yeah. And he represented the monarchical authority. And that's since uh, Hitler didn't like his father, he hated him. That was something that passed uh, on to his later mature life. Uh, and of course, in your favorite Austrian example as well, uh, we can see quite uh, big problems with uh, the loss of the fathering issue. And, and on that subject, we'll also call our last one and see uh, from a traditional point of view, there is a saying that uh, the royal family represents the holy family, but it's smaller. It's the not the king uh, that is the civil servant of the state, but it's the royal family that's the family of the state. And under it comes the smaller family, our family, in which, of course, we have the father and we have the mother and, of course, the children. Uh, the father, uh, father figure of the family is similar to the father figure of the monarchy. Uh, it's something quite different from republical types. And did uh, Emperor and King Karl uh, during his short two-year reign, and of course his attempts uh, in regaining the Hungarian as well as Croatian crowns uh, in Budapest, uh, was he truly a good example of a father figure for the monarchy? For example, oh. Franz Josef truly was, but as his successor, did he succeed in it? Uh, Charles, we have a little uh, connection issues. Uh, we don't have live feed from you. We'll wait for a second. Oh, now we can see you. Okay, we're back. Well, you got to remember he had huge shoes to fill, number one. It was sort of like Edward VII succeeding Victoria or Prince Charles when Queen Elizabeth dies. You know, it, it succeeding an icon is just not easy, no matter who you are. And of course, he succeeded at the worst possible time in the midst of the war. But I would certainly say that by his concern for his different peoples, uh, his attempt to retake the Hungarian throne not simply the second one, which where he had help, but the first attempt where he went single-handedly into Hungary. That took a lot of guts and it took a lot of love for his people to do that. But above all, the day he died, he said, I am suffering that my peoples might come back together. Now that, that by itself, I am suffering that my peoples might come back together. One of the things that's always astonished me about him is that, and I examine the difficulty, shall we say, the nationalist politicians of every nationality put him through. If I had been him, I'd have died cursing the whole bunch. He died loving them. And you know, we spoke earlier about some sort of reunion of Central Europe. I cannot help but believe that it will come to pass somehow or other, precisely because he offered his life for it. And I think that the increase in devotion, well, not just around the world, but certainly in Central Europe, to him and to Zita, may very likely be a part of that process. You know, I've been to several, um, I've been to several events for Kaiser Karl in different parts of the old monarchy, in Zagreb, in Prague, 
in Brandeis at the audience. I've seen people coming together from all over the old empire. Um, I took a couple of classmates of mine, one's from South Tyrol, now in Italy, the other's from Slovak. And I took them to see the Kaiser Parada in honor of Archduke Karl up at Korneuburg, which has reenactment units and all that. It was, it was really quite impressive. And then I introduced them to the Archduke after. As we're driving back, they said to me, you know, we never realized this before, but we're countrymen. I said, yeah, you are. You're countrymen. You're, you both belong to the great family of Habsburg peoples. And um, I will make one other point that is very much on my mind, and that's what's happening in Czechia. Uh, in 1918, they tore down the Marienzoida, the Marian column, both as a sign of victory over the Habsburgs and over the Catholic Church. In 2020, while my country was going up in flames, uh, they rebuilt the Marienzoida. And they put the double eagle back over the fountain in Prague Castle. And now they're rebuilding the Rudetsky Monument in Prague. So it reminded me of a, um, of a, uh, something a Czech lady told me in Hollywood many years ago. There's an old restaurant back when I was a teenager called Little Prague on Hollywood Boulevard. I went in, and it was about 16, 17, and there's a big painting of Franz Josef on the wall. I said to the old Czech lady that ran the joint, I said, ma'am, I thought you Czechs hated the Habsburgs. And she said, well, we used to. But you know, we've had several alternatives since then. None of them have really turned out very well. And that I think it's true of everybody from Tyrol to Transylvania. <laughs> Yeah, I think that all nations of the former Count Ka monarchy can agree that alternatives at least were either horrific, bloody, or just plain dumb like communism. And of course, uh, here is a recommendation to my fellow Croats. Uh, as you all know, three of our more, uh, most important saints of the 20th century uh, are related to uh, Karl, that's of course Karl Aloysius de Pinatz, who was also serving his army. He was a little bit uh, a naughty boy during the late years of the war. Of course, Ivan Mertz, who was truly a, a layman and Catholic. And now we have also the questions of Zita and our, uh, and our Stadler, who was also Archbishop of Sarajevo. And we pray for both of them that they be canonized soon. Uh, of course, you will now see in your links and bio the book of our dear Charles regarding Blessed Charles, his namesake, and I hope you read it and hope that we'll soon have a presentation of it in Zagreb. Uh, since we are now all over with our interview, there are some questions people have asked me to uh, ask you for the end. First, we have a vexicological question. What are the four flags behind you? Ah, uh, funny you should ask. Uh, the top one there, oh, well, you can't see it, but because uh, of the scenery, but the Dannebrog, which is the flag of Denmark, it was sent to me by a Danish viewer of my show. Uh, the double eagle of the House of Habsburg. The Croatian royal flag that was sent to me on the occasion of representing the Croatian Crown Council at the uh, uh, centennial of Field Marshal Morejevic here in Vienna. And lastly, but not leastly, my own people's great flag, the Carillon de Sacre Coeur, the flag of Carillon, which was a, a battle with the Sacred Heart, which was the traditional French Canadian flag back when we were Catholic. And before the quiet revolution of the of the uh, 1960s turned us into idiots. When Quebec was a uh, quite nice place. <laughs> yeah, before we uh, became morons, you know. The second question is, uh, what's the age between Charles and Colombe? Oh, Charles the, the, the A? H. Charles yeah. A. Coulomb? 
Oh, I'll tell you that. It's Aquila, A-Q-U-I-L-A. That was my grandfather's first name. Aquila Espediculum. We okay. all have weird names in my family. Which books, which free books do you recommend beside your own for this centenary to, for people to read? Uh, I would recommend uh, the Bogle's book, A Heart for Europe by Jamie and Joanna Bogle. I would recommend uh, Death of an Emperor by uh, Count Sester Spitzenberg, which you can get from the Gebetsley. It's a pamphlet, really. Um, and then I would uh, I would also recommend, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of his name, an Englishman. It's called The Last Habsburg. Uh, and I cannot think of his name. He's dead now. He's a very fine historian. But the name of the book is The Last Habsburg, and it's the life of Kaiser Karl. And we have a last question. It's more of an American flag. If America ever becomes a monarchy, should it be under Elizabeth II, or should it have its own monarch? Or, you know, the, third, or the third part divided? You know, I wrote a book on that very topic, which I recommend highly. It's we called, know that Bata viewers. <laughs> yep, it's called Star Spangled Crown. <laughs> Not that I'm making a plug. Really, uh, the problem I faced in writing the book was the problem in real life, and that is that there is not a single uh, monarchical. On the one hand, there's not a single monarchical tradition that covers the entire United States. We have Britain, Spain, and France in the continental states, and Russia and Alaska, uh, and others elsewhere. The Hawaiian monarchy, of course, was a separate deal all on its own. But despite that, and although our more recent traditions are Republican, our roots are monarchical. So in the book, I sort of created something out of whole cloth using uh, the Jacobite tradition, as well as the Spanish and French. Uh, but, you know, honestly, I'll just say this about that. Uh, Merle Vandenbroek, who was a German thinker between the wars, said so he wrote something which i've never forgotten and he said it about his own people the germans but it fits a lot of others he said the germans cease to have kings when they cease to be a kingly people and i think before my country can even think of ever having any kind of a monarchy we have to get our minds kind of religiously and culturally straight before we can think about anything else. Otherwise, you'd have kind of like a kind of a political renaissance fair. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I love the renaissance fair. And right. educationally as, as well. I think those oh, memes yeah. about Americans trying to find a country on the map are even getting boring uh, to, to us people in Europe. But in the end, I think America also has a future. We can adjust uh, right away because it's a republic, nor should we ever throw away a country or a nation or a peoples just because of their politicians. That's why we have to always advocate that the rule of God is extended the way he wants it, and that's through a legitimate power and, of course, a monarch that truly cares about its people and now about its uh, party politics. So yeah. thank you again, Charles, for uh, being part of this uh, interview and short lecture. I hope that all of you enjoyed uh, this conversation as much as I did. Charles, any closing, uh, uh, any closing words? Well, yeah, just that, um, you know, I, I going back to uh, going back to something we touched on earlier. Uh, there was a Hungarian monarchist leader, in fact, one of their leading people now. Very, very nice fellow, good Catholic. But when various of his colleagues have complained about some of the imperfections of various members of the House of Habsburg today, his response was, not unlike your own. Oughtn't we try to be sub worthy subjects before we worry about getting a perfect monarch? That's 
that's something to bear in mind. Uh, the funny thing about monarchs and their subjects is that there's a symbiosis. And they do tend to resemble each other. And pray very, very hard, both for uh, uh, the House of Habsburg and for Central European politicians as a whole, that they'll see the light. <laughs> And pray very hard, too, for Ukraine and Russia, that uh, this madness end. Uh, I can agree with that, as always I tell when people say, ah, I'm pro-Russian just because West is uh, has uh, the generous in it. Generous can be always cured. People can be cured. People can be turned, but people cannot be brought uh, from the death only for God, only for Christ, and that's why war is never an answer, even though it might seem that way, even though it might give quick solutions, war is only suffering and death, and that's why in the end, even in the shadow of the centenary of our beloved king and our beloved saint, we must pray to him that God hears our prayers and this uh, truly horrific war stops. Thank you all for your attention and I hope that this talk was interesting, fun and educative for you as well it was for me. Thank you all for your concentration and your support. Thank you for your time given for these lectures. Our last farewell words will be given by Mr. Borna Kuri. Master of Informatics and Secretary of the Croatian Royal Council and our technical support during these lectures. Thank you, Valentina. Well, dear viewers, thank you for joining us on this very special day. Finishing up our event, I'd like to take a few minutes to put my own, own thoughts into words. Even though today's event is a commemoration of an old early death, I believe its importance lies in many positive messages that Blessed Charles has left behind. On the most basic of levels, it's a remembrance of a great man, but for all of us, I believe it's also something much, much more. Today's event uh, makes us reflect on our own faith and makes us ask ourselves, what are we doing to carry on the ideals of Blessed Charles? For the many peoples of his crown land, Blessed Charles embodied various things. For us in Croatia, as a king, he is considered a figure of tradition and a defender of our national and political rights, things that we have lost in the 20th century ahead. But as an emperor, Charles was also a father figure to other nations as well, and thus he represents a proto-European figure of unity and with his beatification also a spiritual figure that we can all rally under together, united in our differences. Reflecting uh, over the importance of uh, Blessed Charles, Croatian Royal Council has elected to mark his death in two ways, by sending our delegates to Madeira to mark this event with dignitaries from all over the world, and secondly, by holding this event with all of you. Finally, I'd like to thank our speakers, Valentina Kershun, Ante Bresic von Mekulic, and the Charles Colomb. Thank you for your time, and to all the viewers, thank you for joining us too. Blessed Charles, please guide us.